So then we get into the small scale pilot infiltration test. So this has been the more accepted version where you're actually digging a test pit with a backhoe. Bottom area is typically 12 to 32 square feet. So you're looking at about a six by two foot wide, you see a two foot wide bucket by six, seven feet long. Um, and then we're introducing water into that system. So on the, the picture on the right is a flow meter. So we're bringing water in at a constant rate and keeping a constant head on that outflow at the base. So you're, you're calculating a flow in and getting a flow out down the bottom at the same time. So with, based upon the area, uh, you're getting an infiltration rate. Things to remember on, the, on any of these tests when we get into the pit tests is the duration and how long it's actually gonna have to take. In a real coarse grain soil, you can bypass to a certain degree the soaking period because you really can't keep water in it to soak it. But once you get into a finer grain material, uh, the soaking period, so these tests can last up to uh, 10 to 12 hours. So again, allowing the time, allowing the budget to have somebody go out and actually run one of these tests. Next would be the large scale pilot infiltration test. This is when you have a greater area for infiltration. So the, the large scale test is a bottom area of, of 100 square feet, typically not used. I'd say the majority of the time, the small scale pit test is applicable and recommended. We get into the large scale test, you're, you're looking at a, a lot more water. Uh, when you think about a 100 square, fit, square foot pit, um, the amount of water it's gonna take um, to actually run the test is going to be enormous. Um, a typical uh, test in a small scale used a water truck, we can dump three to 4,000 gallons of water pretty quickly. So you know, you'll end up having to refill several times. So again, both of these uh, availability to water uh, with a hydrant is preferable. Uh, you may run out pretty quickly if you're just relying on a, on a water truck. Another method, basically uh, we've come up with different ways to try to limit the area of the pit. In a permeable paving section, you're really limiting yourself to that surface material. On most applications, you're stripping away the, basically the top soil and the organic layer to get down to your receptor horizon, which can any, be anywhere from six inches to a foot. Um, so really the ability to, if we go out there and dig a test pit, may, we may be three, four feet below the bottom of our receptor horizon. We've kind of come up with different ways to try to limit to be able to perform the test, but keep it at a shallow depth. So this picture on the right is actually from uh, the WSU facility where we actually did the testing. Um, kind of, we're being resourceful. Uh, this is a type two or CB riser, so a 48 inch diameter. The one before that is a, a six foot ring. One of our contractors that we use will we'll put into the ground. But again, the, the type two risers work pretty well. And a lot of times uh, if you're under construction, you've got them sitting around, um, great opportunity to, to confine that. So what we can do with that is actually put head above the ground surface. So uh, we just drop this down to six inches below, packed dirt around the outside, and we're able to run the test basically at a surface of where we, we wanted to with minimal stripping. So it worked out pretty well. So once you get your infiltration rate for the field rate, that needs to be corrected for an actual rate to be used in the design. Correction factor choosing is critical, to say the least. It takes a fair amount of judgment, uh, but it also depends on what you think is gonna be reliable. So the first one is your CF sub V, which is your site variability coefficient. So that really has to do with working with your, your geotech and maybe past experience on how much we think the site is gonna vary throughout the area. Are we gonna have outwash conditions that grade to silts are we going to have or are we going to have a, a, an outwash condition or a beach sand or like a Marysville type situation where it's just sandy everywhere okay so if we're real confident in our um, ability or the, the the soil conditions throughout the site we may pick a, a, a coefficient that's it's fairly high closer to one but then uh, maybe we only do one test or maybe we've got you know 30 tests out there again between the two of those coming up with a, a correction factor that you feel comfortable with uh, based upon the amount of information that you're able to obtain as well as how variable you might think the conditions are. 0.5 is kind of a place to start and working with that from there and see where it goes. If, if we are gonna assume something and you're not sure where to start, 0.5 is kind of a good place to start. And then the quality of your pavement base material. So that's that has to do with the rock that's in your reservoir. So how clean the material is, how confident you are of your source. There are sources out there that get into a more granitic type of crushed rock, may have a little bit more rock flour that develops during the crushing process versus a basalt rock that really has not much byproduct of, of dust on it. So again, 
closer to one. If you know it's going to stay clean, you know you got a good source of rock. So those are multiplied together uh, to come up with your design value to factor down your measured rate. Next piece is your, your base material and its suitability for uh, water treatment. We need something in that subgrade to get the water quality element that we have in our permeable pavement section. A lot of times the, the on-site materials can achieve the criteria that we're looking for. The cation exchange capacity greater than five is fairly easily obtained fairly easy to, to achieve in most cases. Organic content greater than 1%. Um, when you get down to a, a good advanced outwash, um, that's going to be fairly difficult to achieve. Um, but if you're up in the recessional outwash, it happens quite regularly that we're going to get that, that number that's above 1%. Um, it's good to see that that number has dropped. It used to be way up in the, the 8 to 10 range, and we had one heck of a time getting an infiltration rate. Uh, with trying to balance that in the organic content. And I believe the LID manual says it at 0.5%. And I think there's, a, there's two numbers out there, but go with the, the greater one. And then your measured rate of less than 12 inches per hour. So we don't want material that infiltrates too fast, but we don't want it also be to be your limiting factor either. And then we have to have a, at least one foot of the soil with these characteristics to get our wall to quality treatment. So actual testing on site, run down through these for a commercial site, 5,000 square feet of permeable pavement. Uh, residential site is one test per 200 feet of road in every lot. And it can be reduced based upon professional judgment to a certain degree. Some jurisdictions will take it more serious than others. But again, looking at your site conditions and the, the variability that goes along with the, the type of depositional environment that we have here, uh, really, I think more is better. Uh, it's always better to, to throw your money up front to uh, come up with the criteria for infiltration. Uh, then find out later that uh, we've got spots that, that don't infiltrate. After you do your test also, it's important to dig out that area. So we do a, like the pit test that I described, run the test, don't just walk away when you're done. Have them dig it out down a couple of feet below because maybe your test was slow, we may be sitting right on top of a restrictive layer and really it meant nothing. Or it's it foot down, we've got to restrict, everything was going sideways. So again, dig out what's down below. Uh, find out why, why that pit were, or why the water was, was doing what it was supposed to be doing. Wrapping up the whole testing piece of it, just to kind of give you a, a cartoon of what we're talking about with the large versus the small scale of things, you're really trying to maximize your area of testing. You've got to get a broad range rather than the small diameter pipe. Mounting analysis, the next piece of the pie. So we've got our exploration, we've got our groundwater depth, we've got our infiltration potential. Now what happens to the water after we put it in the ground? So a large facility such as a pond accentuates the mounting process when you're putting a lot of water into one spot. The beauty of permeable pavements is you're spreading that mound over a very, very large area. An example of that, where you had you know, water for a large parking lot, we put it into a pond that's properly sized, we get several feet of mounding. We are able to spread it over an entire parking lot, we get inches of mounding. So to be able to do that mounting analysis, uh, we're working directly with the civils and the amount of water that's going back in the ground, okay? So the first thing we need to know in a mounting analysis is the water table elevation. Do we have something that's already there that we're building upon as we put water back in the ground? The actual rate of the native soils. Mounting analysis is basically a, a computer model of the, the subsurface conditions and, and how water is going to behave. So knowing that infiltration rate of the water in its vertical sense, which is then transformed into a horizontal piece where what we're trying to do is find out how fast that mound is going to dissipate. So we've got the depth of the water table, the infiltration rate of the native soils, then we need to know the thickness and the hydraulic conductivity of the saturated zone. So once it does get saturated, how fast does it go sideways? So those, those numbers are based upon the vertical rate. Use either mod flow or mod ret. Uh, we use mod ret. Um, but there's two different programs that can uh, run through the, the mounting analysis. We're working hand in hand with the civils on this too. So there's all this information that we've got with water after it gets there, but what we need to know as hydrogeologists is how much is coming in. So working with the civils to find out, we need daily flows, we need peak flows. Running the model for the surface water program to be able to get all those peak flows is really important to what we end up doing cartoon of the mounting piece kind of shows you what happens after the water goes in the ground. So we've got a, a large facility here. As time goes, we get more water in, the mound develops, 
So what again we're we're trying to find out is is how fast that water is going sideways and how fast that mound can dissipate. So in the, the DOE manual, the detailed approach, kind of summarizing here, using methods to estimate the infiltration rate with with caution. So again, those correction factors can make a big difference in in how, the sizing of your facility. So using um, good judgment on where where to go with those is is fairly important and work with your project team on on that infiltration rate it's not a function of depth to groundwater facility size or facility aspect ratio but an actual um, a function of the grain size okay um, so using the the formula to come up with that but better yet uh, actual testing so we can actually get a good number with the the infiltration rate and there's a note here, ModRet can be unstable, better use ModFlow. I think really it, it depends on the user as far as that goes. ModRet is a very stable program in our, what we've done, but it really depends on your, your input parameters and, and, and how you're used to running it. Infiltration assessment is site, site characterization. Again, looking at not just your site, but off-site, how it's going to affect uh, the off-site properties and how we're going to get rid of water. Being able to do a, a thorough investigation, put your money up front, it pays off in the end, uh, and it can also save you a lot, too. If we're, we're going into a, a site that we don't think is going to infiltrate, but if we can do a little bit more exploration, we might find little pockets that we can actually do something with. Uh, make sure we, we get good numbers, and again, using that with those correction factors. Ground water separation, the high winter water monitoring can be pretty important, can be a make or break situation. So again, think ahead. If we start a project in the spring, we're doing a lot of exploration in the summer, but we know it's not going to go to the permits or anything until the following year. Take the extra time to put in a piezometer or something out in the field because it can save you. If we don't put it in, we didn't monitor through that winter, we go back to the next summer and now we find out that we're going to have to get a, a high water winter monitoring that delays things another year to, to be able to, to do that, to try to get that. Because we really, I mean, you can look at soil and, and see a lot of times on that, that, that upper piece with the modeling, but it's not necessarily going to give the indication of the high. So again, thinking ahead and the potential for that. Uh, correction factors, uh, again, use them with caution. And the mounting analysis, there's a fair amount that goes into that, uh, making sure that we have the information up front and um, working with the civils to be able to get everything that we need. Understanding the geology, I think this is kind of the brunt of the whole thing, is, is understanding your geology once you're, when you're talking subsurface, understanding where the water is going to go, what kind of formation you have, and, and where we can actually put a facility.